Well, good evening. Welcome to Wednesday Night Recharge. Hopefully you have been enjoying our series this semester as we've walked through and looked at the demands that Jesus gives to the world, right? When Jesus teaches, he has demands and expectations. Um, and uh, just recently, we, we'd walk through how Jesus demands that every one of us rejoice, that we be filled with joy as his followers, okay? And last week, we looked at this demand to pray, all right, to pray at all times, to understand that you come before uh, it, the heavenly father and, and pray dependence upon him. I remind you of those because tonight's topic is going to, to feel less than rechargey, if you will, okay? Um, tonight's topic, Jesus demands that we fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, that we would fear him. Now, uh, last semester, I think it was, maybe it was a year ago, we, we had, uh, I was met at the door and someone was like, well, just so you know, pastor, we had a visitor here tonight and uh, uh, it was their first time and you happened in recharge to talk about hell. And they left and they said, I don't feel very recharged. <laughs> I, I believe it. I understand. All right. So keep it in the context we've been walking through. But this is so important that, that we would speak about all that Jesus says to us. Yes, we like to focus on the rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. But this too is a demand. So let me read our passages. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus speaking. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, just so you know, for the context, Jesus is talking to his disciples. The entire context around that is teaching that you would say, oh yeah, disciples need to know this and disciples need to know that. This is not to lost people. This fear is for us. I remind you with Isaiah 8, uh, 12 and 13 in the Old Testament, God speaking through Isaiah, and you are not to fear what they fear or to be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy and he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. Again, Luke 19, 27. <clears throat> Jesus speaking in a parable about a king who had gone on a journey and come back and wicked men had risen up. And he says, but these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Very harsh. Matthew 25, 46. These will go away into eternal punishment the, but the righteous into eternal life. Then I give one more passage out of the New Testament where Paul tells us, so then my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So let us begin with the staunch reality of hell. Jesus spoke and taught about it often with vivid description, eternal punishment, the fire of hell, an unquenchable fire with intense suffering that is endless. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9 describes hell as forever away from the presence of the Lord. And to describe what that is like <clears throat> as really an active and deserving punishment for sin against a holy God. 
It's not enough to say it is passive punishment. When you genuinely study it, you must come to the conclusion that it is active punishment. Like a judge sentencing a criminal to hard labor. And the Bible would say that this is just, that this is right for our sin. Now, our passage, our chief passage in Matthew 10, 28, yes, you and I are to fear hell and the description of it, but that is not what the, what the scripture passage says for us to do here. It actually says for us to fear him, to fear him who is able to judge and cast someone into hell. And again, I read uh, Isaiah 8, 13, that the Lord, that, that he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. So how do we balance last week or two weeks ago's demand that Christians rejoice Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Or even in this context, in Matthew 10, where right after Jesus says this, he also says, hey, you're, do not worry about the, the things that happen of the, your father knows what you need, okay? And, and the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear because your father knows. And are you not more valuable than a sparrow? That's the exact same context here. <clears throat> so how is it that we are to roll up our sleeves and understand the complexity and the balance of scripture that on one hand tells us to fear God, but on the other uh, says that we are to fear his wrath? Well, the key is to know and to understand that God himself is the one who has removed his wrath from us through his son, right? We don't like to think much on the wrath of God, but if you minimize the wrath of God, if you minimize sin before a holy God, you actually minimize the love of God, which is accomplished in the cross of Christ, Okay, to look deeply and to understand fully the holiness, the magnificence, how God must be just, how sin must be, must be punished, how holy and, and just eternal and magnificent he is. To understand all of that in its fullness and its entirety then is to at the same time understand the key of all that Christ has accomplished on your behalf. That the very one who hates sin to the extent and must judge sin is the very one who has overcome those very things on our behalf. In other words, the ransom price has been paid in full. It's only then that you understand. So John Piper had a, uh, a helpful illustration. He said he was invited over to a friend's house and they said uh, they had a big German shepherd, a big dog in their backyard. They said he's very friendly. He loves children. And they had a little three-year-old at the time. Um, and uh, he, he, would, he would play in the backyard, but suddenly they forgot something in, out of their car. And they told a uh, little one, run to the car and, and get... Uh, get uh, something out of the car. And when he started to do so, the German shepherd came behind with this uh, low growl. And the owner said, oh, he does not like it when you run away from him. Now that is a good illustration of what God is like. That is when you are in his presence, when you are not running away from him, his disposition towards you is a particular way. But that, that parable where Jesus said, but those who did not wish to have my rule, they were running away. They said, other things are better than me. It is at that point that the 
fear and the dread of God should rise up. So let me close with this simple statement. And that is these three points, all right? That is you and I must let fear have its positive effect. We must let fear have its positive effect. First, in the recognition that sin is unfathomably more serious than you and I could ever imagine, okay? The reason hell seems so extreme is because of where we sit and what we truly know and think of God. Because when you think of a crime that is committed against someone, it grows in severity based on the person who has been uh, sinned against, okay? So real quick example, let's say there is a beating, a beating of a dog, a beating of an average person, and a beating of the United States president. With each of those people, there is a variation, right, in uh, dignity and honor and title that is associated with each of them. And in each of those instances, the case would be tried completely different. And the severity of the, uh, of the punishment is completely different. Why? Because there's a different amount of dignity and even associated with the office itself. So now think about God Almighty who dwells in unapproachable light. So when the scripture says that hell is real, that it is eternal, and that it is just, and the reason it is shocking to our system is because we do not understand him. We do not understand him. So if we are to let fear have its positive effect, that is that you and I would grow in our understanding of the seriousness of sin. <clears throat> Secondly, to let fear have its positive effect, it guards against unbelief and self-righteousness. And what I mean by this, right, is when you understand the gravity of sin, the enormity of sin, the justness of sin, then first you understand your only hope, your only hope is in the finished work of Jesus Christ, okay? <clears throat> you run back to the gospel, back to the foot of the cross. You know it is not in any of your own standing. It guards against self-righteousness to genuinely have a fear of the Lord, Okay, think of what I'm saying, because if we as a people find ourselves, if, if the community finds us to be overly self-righteous, then part of the issue is we do not think well and rightly about hell and about, and about the holiness of God. And thirdly, to let fear have its positive effect, it compels us with urgency. It compels us with urgency. Urgency, one, for the lost. Because they do not know him. Because at his coming, our response will be nothing but delight. Our Savior is here. Our Savior is here. But for them, Revelation 6 says, they will hide in the caves and beg for the rocks to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. An urgency for those who haven't heard to pray for the lost, to be bold in our proclamation, an urgency. If there is no urgency, 
Maybe it is that we really do not fear him who can cast soul and body into hell. And finally, that we would maximize our one life. Our one life that you have all of your days. Your time is short. Your resources are short. That we would not waste our one life to allow the fear to have its positive effect. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, King Jesus, teach us to tremble in a good way. Teach us to fear him who will cast soul and body into hell. Teach us to understand the gravity of sin, but allow that to spur us with urgency, not in self-righteousness, but make us cling to the cross and then to tell others and to use our one life to spend it for the glory of the gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.